Okay, thank you very much. Okay, good. Thank you, um, and welcome to the third and fourth lecture this morning about this. So let me just give a quick recap about uh, the main points that we learned yesterday. So what we learned is we, in the end of the two hours lectures, we, we landed on this collinear factorization picture, which I summarize here. So whether you have a DIS kind of process with a lepton and the proton in the initial state, or a proton, 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 antiproton state. So in both cases, you always have, in the collinear factorization picture, you can always write your cross section for electron, proton going into something else, or proton, proton into something else, factorized like that. So exactly like in the parton model, but um, what we learned yesterday is that the, the parton distribution functions do acquire a dependence on an unphysical scale, which is the factorization scale, which is usually set to the scale of the process, and then times the partonic cross-section, which in turn will depend on the scales. Because remember that we split the logarithm in two, so th that kind of arbitrary scale that we, in that we introduced into the calculation to factorize the structure of the proton from the parton interaction was present also there. And on top of it, remember that we also have the expansion in the strong coupling constant, which depends on the renormalization scale. So we have two arbitrary scales. But the most important thing here is that this picture over here is universal. So it has been proven not for all cross-section, but for most inclusive cross-section that we care about that no matter what happens here at the level of the partonic interaction, this function fi, fi, fj, in the case you've got two protons, they are universal. So they're independent of the process, okay? And this is something that uh, in uh, the TMD, you don't have this nice uh, um, property, you know? So the universality is really something that it's an extremely important property because it means that we can extract this function from all kinds of processes that are inclusive enough for which factorization holds, and these functions are guaranteed to be the same, okay? So this is the point. And then the second thing that we learned yesterday is that the evolution of these functions with the scale mu f is something which is predicted by perturbative QCD. So we set up a kind of renormalization group equation for the function fi, so for all the partonic parton distribution functions, which couples the gluon with the quarks. And by solving that equation, which has perturbative kernels, we can predict them using perturbative QCD, the evolution of the PDF with the scale. The second thing that we learned, and, and that's what we said in the first part of the last lecture, is that whenever you look at this formula, which is what you use in order to make any theoretical prediction at the LHC or in general Hadron Colliders, you have theoretical uncertainties associated to each one of these terms. So yesterday we discussed how you compute, how you estimate more than compute, the theoretical uncertainty associated with the fact that you truncate the partonic cross-section um, for these processes here. And today we will learn how we compute the theoretical uncertainty associated to this other part of the process is the one associated with the partonic with the parton distribution functions, which was the blue uncertainty in the plot we saw yesterday. So what are we going to talk about? So first of all, I will mention what are the ingredients of a global fit of parton distribution functions. And then I think today, we, if we manage to talk about the experimental input and the methodological aspect, we are good to go. And then if there is time, we can also talk about the theoretical aspect, but we will see if there is time, okay? And then tomorrow we will finish with some new frontiers and challenges, okay? Very good. So this is the picture that I showed yesterday. So um, as I said, we want to determine these functions so these are infinite dimensional objects uh, for each of the independent parton i, so up, anti-up, down, anti-down, strange, anti-strange, blue on, and blah, blah, blah. Then I'll tell you about the heavy quark. And this thing depends on two variables. So the dependence on mu is given by perturbative QCD, but the dependence on x 
which in the partonic model is the fraction of momentum carried by the parton i, the fraction of the proton's momentum carried by the fraction i, this is something that we need to determine from the data. And I'll show you that we can do it thanks to the universality and the evolution. So once we determine the parton distribution functions at a given scale, like in this case, square root of 10 GV, once we know this function and their uncertainty, then we can evolve them to any other scale, for example, to 100 GV by using perturbative QCD. Okay, is that clear? So now the, the, the thing is, how do we determine these functions and their uncertainty at a given initial scale? Okay, so that's what we want to learn today. Please interrupt me at any point if you have questions as you did yesterday. So I think, as I showed you, in 1984, when there was the first kind of determination of this function, so at the time here we had only the, the valence quark distribution, the gluon and, and the quark valence. So as I showed, these were lines and it was already impressive to see that, you know, these kind of shapes that people were finding for the parton distribution functions were fitting all the data because somehow it was showing the universality of this function that was not yet completely proven. It was a bit of a miracle of QCD to see that actually the collinear factorization works. But this thing, you know, because we had data that had a lot of uncertainty, so it was fine just to find a, a kind of a shape that made sense that kind of fit in the data. But clearly, now we cannot do these things anymore. So we, we, because the data have become so precise that we cannot just be happy with a line that more or less fits all the data. So we really want to have a line that is determined precisely and has an uncertainty. And in the past 30 to 40 years, there has been a huge progress um, that really have changed a lot our understanding of the protos. So this is one of the latest exercise of the combination of different uh, PDF that have been extracted by various groups uh, in 2015 and in 2021. And you can see that, for example, the gluon at 100 GV, when, even when you combine these different sets, has an uncertainty of only 2%, two, 2%, okay? So uh, in, in this intermediate X region, but I will tell you what that means later on, okay. Very good. So let's talk about what are the ingredients of a PDF fit. So, um, so it looks like a kind of trivial game, but it's not, as you will see, because the devil is always in the details. So you want to choose experimental data that you want to include. Uh, you want to include as many as possible from many different sources, and you want to include all their error and their systematical uncertainty. Especially now we are getting to a point where the correlation between different data points is super crucial because this is a kind of systematic correlated uncertainty that really um before you know we were not including it but in the past 10 years we realized how important it is okay so let uh, if there are two systematics that are correlated if the uncertainty goes up in one data it goes up into the, the nearby data point okay this is what i mean then we have to choose a theory settings so the perturbative order of our calculation how we deal with the heavy quark masses, whether we include or not the electroweak correction, whether we use an intrinsic heavy quark, alpha S, quark masses value, all the QCDs. So whenever you do a fit, you have to choose what is the theory that you use to predict the partonic cross section that go into the fit of the PDF, okay? So, and this is something that you keep fixed normally in a fit, okay? Then you have to choose a starting scale, Q0, where perturbative QCD applies. So it has to be above the Landau pole. So, but usually it's set to be about one to two GV as a starting scale. And then you want to parameterize all the independent quarks, anti-quarks and gluon distribution at the starting scale Q0, okay? And then you solve the Diglap evolution equation from the initial scale Q0 to the scale of the experimental data and you build the observables that depend on the parameters of this function that you want to determine. And then you fit this function to the data, okay? And then you provide PDF error sets to compute the PDF uncertainty, okay? So that people, whenever, I don't know if any of you has ever used the LHA PDF interface, did you use it? Yes, someone has. Okay, so this is a kind of common 
um, repository in which all PDF sets that have been produced by the different PDF fitting collaboration can be found. So typically the user call functions like that. Okay, so you, you just call the different members. So you have an index for the members of the PDF set and you combine them together to get not only the central value for each of the quark and anti-quark and gluon, but also their uncertainty. I will tell you at the end of this lecture how you compute them, okay? Very good. So this is the thing. So it looks like easy, but it's a very complex machinery because uh, you know the experimental data, you need a lot of statistical framework, and this is the tricky part, the parameterization, the error propagation, the minimization. You need to have very precise theoretical calculation, and then I will tell you how it's not trivial to put this precise calculation inside the feed. These all go into global feed, and then you give the output for the users, okay? And typically, um, people were saying, you know, it's a kind of sausage factory. Nobody knows what goes into the sausages and whatever. So now we are trying to become a bit more transparent, you know, on everything that is included in here because it does make a big difference, okay? That's something I will show you later on. Okay, so let's talk about the experimental input. So as I mentioned yesterday, the PDFs, we, you never measure a PDF. No? So what you measure is what you've got here on the left-hand side. So you measure observables that convolute PDFs with the partonic cross-section. So you have a non-trivial dependence on the function that you want to find. So it's not even a linear combination, it's really an integral of uh, a convolution product, okay? And they appear either in DIS-like observables or in Hadron-Hadron observables. So, and also we have to be careful because in most fits, uh, if you just keep, uh, you know, in the collinear picture, so you are neglecting or integrating the transverse momentum. And so you have to remember that we can include observables for which these terms, the terms that you do not include in the collinear picture are not super important because otherwise you are not using the correct theoretical framework to describe the observable. So most feet exclude the regions where the factorization fails to apply. For example, in the very low Q square region, because you see this does, these terms are not um, suppressed and in the very large X. Uh, and, and here it depends on what, uh, what we do. So, but these are the kind of typical cuts that um, PDF collaboration puts. So Q square minimum is set to two GV squared and W square minimum, which is this combination. Remember W was what I call MH, the invariant mass uh, of, of the final state that you produce in a DIS collision that's set to 12.5 GV. Because if you go below that, you have to include either kind of effects like higher twist contribution that give you more terms uh, in, in this formula. You have to include um, other kind of um, you know, look, you know, effects that become important that normally we, we ignore. Okay, and again, why do we need to include lots of data? Because different data constrain different PDF combinations. So when you take a data, you have to identify what are the part on luminosity. So what are the partons that contribute to that cross section? And also they constrain, and I'm gonna show you explicitly in the next 10 slides, they constrain the X that you want to fit in different regions, okay? So for example, so something that we always use is deep elastic scattering data. So they're very abundant, they're very precise, but as you can see from, from the kind of linear combination of the structure function that we showed yesterday, you only have U minus U bar, D minus D bar, or you have U plus U bar, U plus D bar, blah, blah. So you, only have combining F2 and F3 from neutrino, antineutrino, electron, positron. You only have four combination of quarks that you can directly constrain. Plus you have the gluon in an indirect way because the gluon is the one that causes the scaling of the cross-section, the, the violation of the Bjork and scaling. Remember that we said it yesterday. So, um, so that's why HERA data are not enough to fit uh, all these distributions. So you can only fit some combination. You also need older like DIS data and Drellian data that are still used because of the other spin symmetry and, and because they constrain some combination that I will show you later. And also WNZ boson final state 
provide lots of information. Um, and then we have lots of processes with jets or heavy cork in the final state that help to handle the glue. So this is something that we will discuss in turn. Yes. No, so the universality of PDF, so the collinear factorization has been proven for some, so like Colin Soper, they proved it for uh, DIS, for the inclusive, like for example, WNZ production. In, um, and uh, for, I think there are three or four paper, uh, for example, for jets. Yeah, yeah, exactly, for WNZ, so Drellian, lepton pair production. But, and we assume that it's uh, good enough for, I don't know, all the jets observables, the TT bar and so on. Yes, yes, exactly. So I think, so it has been proven theoretically for, you know, Drellian and DIS, but uh, we, we have good reasons to assume that given that, you know, these functions fit well, also the jets data, the top data. So if we are inclusive enough, so if we don't, take very exclusive observables, then this is work. So usually we say collinear factorization works for inclusive enough observables, which are the observables that we include here, okay? Yeah, any other question? Very good, so here, I think I took it from one of the NMPDF papers. So it's the kinematic coverage. So this is something that everybody will show you whenever they do a fit of PDF. So let's look at it in details. So these are the X, this is the X region that the data set uh, cover. How do you calculate it? You take the leading order kinematics, okay? So you, you take the kinematics for X like in the Parton model. I show you explicitly later what I mean. But for example, for DIS, this is the Bjorken X, okay? So this is the Bjorken X, which remember depends on the energy and the, and the angle of the scattered electrons. So, you can see that, for example, for deep inelastic scattering data, which are the green point here, they cover region from nearly 10 to the minus four, and they go up to region like 0 0.8. But here there is a difference because this point over here, and I will show you later, these are the one covered by Hera, and this one in the corner, like lower Q square and larger X are the one covered by fixed target the uh, yeah, deep inelastic scattering experiment. So there is a very important complementarity between the collider DIS experiment and the fixed target experiment, which I'll show you in a minute. Then you have uh, um, Drellian rapidity distribution. Again, I show you how you can compute that. So it really depends on the mass of the Drellian pairs that you produce the partonic section, the, the center of mass energy and the rapidity at which you produce this pair. So these are the orange points that you can see here. And you can see that many of them are in the on shell region. So when you produce a Z and the Z goes into, I don't know, electron and positron pair or muon and muon pair. So these are the on shell, but then you also measure them in the lower invariant mass region, so outside of the peak of the Z and the W or in the high invariant mass region. Then we have um, Drellian invariant mass distribution. Here in the very large energy corner, you have jets, rapidity and PT distribution. And then here you can see in orange some points that come from heavy quark, total cross-section and so on. I will tell you later. But so as you can see here, you have that the same region in X is constrained by a variety of points, okay? So let's take uh, X equal to 0 0.1. So there are data from the deep inelastic scattering fixed target from Hera. You have data that are from Drellian rapidity distribution. You have data from TT bar distribution and jets. So there are lots of different data sets that pick up the same X for the same parton distributions, okay? So, and that's something very important to understand because very often this plot is flashed upon you. So I wanted to go a bit into depth. So, oh, yes. So because for each point uh, you measure, so uh, every experiment, so every cross section you measure um, yeah. is measured at a given scale. And this is usually, for example, if you produce a Z boson, you take Q equal to the mass of the Z boson, okay? 
uh, or if you take uh, or if you measure adrenaline, so something like lepton anti lepton pair, the scale which you have on, on the y axis is the invariant mass of the lepton pair that you are producing. Okay, so this is the scale q squared. And X is the leading order kinematics. And I'll tell you exactly what it is in the next few slides. Does it answer your question? Okay. So here I just wanted to show that's the leading order kinematics, okay? Because whenever you produce something, imagine you have part on, uh, one that has got X1 uh, P. So X1, the energy of the first proton, and the other one has X2, the energy of the other proton and then you produce something that has invariant mass m. So the leading order kinematic is that basically you know that x1, x2, s minus m squared, right? So at leading order, uh, what you're producing is something. So you have something like a delta of this, okay? So you, want, you know that the mass, so by con energy conservation, the mass of the thing you produced is equal to the energy that goes in, which is x1, x2 times the center of mass energy of the thing. So from that, you know that in the leading order kinematics, the x1 and x2, so the fraction of protons momentum that you are constraining, when you produce a particle of mass m at the center of mass s is equal to m divided by square root of s, and then you have e to the plus or minus the rapidity. The rapidity is the angle at which they are produced, okay? And that's why you have a line, because the q squared is always m. But when you vary the rapidity beams, so very often you have beams between 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, this is what vary this exponent. And this gives you all the dots that you can see here, okay? So for the same m, but for different axes, okay? And we, we will see this formula later, but I think, um, okay, really good. So, Hera data, so we have lots of those. Um, actually, we should cut this, this region over here. So these, the Hera data are the one, you know, you have uh, the electron proton collider that run for, for a long time and they gave us really precise measurement of the structure function uh, and and the kinematic coverage is the following. So it goes down to 4, 10 to the minus 5, up to 0 0.6, and Q squared goes between 3 and, and 5, 10 to the 4 GV squared. And, um, you know, these are the kind of events that are observed at HERA. So, for example, a, new, a neutral current event is when an electron proton goes into an electron, and this is, is what's showing one of these events. For example, here Q is 180 GV, the inelasticity is really high and also the xb can is high. So it happens that the incident electron, 27 GV scatters against the proton that comes on the other side and the electron is scattered back by 160 degrees and, and with a given energy of 300 GV. So basically what I'm saying is that depending on the angle and depending on, on the energy, you, you really measure how far you go into the x can of the that you are probing, right? So that's what's happening here. So that's the experimental event that you can see. Uh, or you can also have charge current event in the case when the DIS scattering is mediated by a W. In this case, you only see like the hadron coming out of it, but you don't see anything else. So you only have missing energy because of the neutrino that was produced because of the W exchange, okay? So this is a kind of charge current event, and we have lots of those, although less precisely measured at HERA. Okay, very good. And then the other thing which is interesting is that um, they can also measure the contribution from F3, because if I, so this is the kind of um, updated measurement of, of what I showed you in the first lecture. So you can see that there is a very, very precise measurement of the neutral current. And the neutral current is a combination of F1, F2, and F3. I remember that F3 has different signs depending if you have electron or positron in the initial state. And this is what gives you the split. So basically, uh, at some point when you go to large enough energy, you can see that the, the plus or minus sign that we saw yesterday in the exercise whenever we include the F3 distribution. 
So in this case, the difference between these two is what helps you measuring the axial contribution to the structure functions, okay? Which is interesting because it probes a different combination of the quark. So you have U minus U bar, D minus D bar and so on. Okay, so and you can see that it becomes visible at a larger Q square and, uh, and a smaller um, at that larger X, okay? Because here X goes to 0 at 65. Okay, very good. And then uh, let me go back exactly. That's what I was saying before. So what is measured at HERA in the neutral current, it's really a linear combination of F2, F3 and FL with this sign that depends on electron or positron. And these are the combination, the ones that where you found yesterday in the exercise if you try to do it. So you have the F2 has this combination of the quark anti-quark, F3 has got the minus sign and the, the structure functions mediated by a W plus or W minus have these yet different combination of U, D bar, D bar U and so on. So that's why I was saying that from these, you can really get information about the four light quark and anti-quark in some regions, okay? So you really have to, to rearrange those to find from the structure function measurement, the direct constraints on the quark. And then the longitudinal structure function, remember that yesterday we said that at the leading order, this is something which is zero because it was F1 minus two X F2, and this is something that disappeared because of the, in the parton model, because of the nature of spin one half. So the only longitudinal part is due to the gluon. So that's why there are important measurements done on the longitudinal structure functions because they constrain the gluon at small x, which is the one that gives you a longitudinal component. It doesn't come from the quark, it comes from the bosons, which are the gluons, okay? Very good. And, um, and that's it, so I don't... Okay, good. So yes, of course, how do I uh, yeah, repeat the question? So the question is how experimentally do you identify the longitudinal component of the structure functions? Yeah, I've wrote, uh, yeah, exactly. I've wrote there what is Y. So Y plus minus is one plus or minus one minus Y squared. And Y remember is the inelasticity. So is one minus the energy of the outgoing electron divided by the energy of the incoming electron. So as Alberto said, exactly. So I think you can find some regions of Y in which the F2 contribution uh, goal is small and only then you're left with the FL contribution. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Albert. Okay, very good. Um, yeah, here I just want to show what are the functions that are found, but it doesn't matter. So here I wanted to talk a bit about fixed target DIS data because they, are in this corner here, and they give very important additional information as compared to the collider DIS data. Um, and very often experimentally, what is measured is the deuteron structure function, okay? Uh, and also you have uh, the other targets, like usually isoscalar targets, uh, uh, like iron or copper and so on. So, and if you want, in a very naive way, um, so the neutron structure function can be seen like the, the average of the proton and the neutral structure function. And when you assume the SU2 isospin symmetry, then like the neutron is just like a proton where you exchange U and D. Okay, so uh, basically the up function of the neutron is like the down PDF of the proton and the down PDF of the neutron is like the up PDF of the proton. So it's interesting because when you look at, for example, the difference or the ratio of the proton and neutron structure function, which is what is measured in many of these fixed target DIX experiments, you get a very precious handle on the U over D distribution by exploiting this SU2 isospin symmetry between neutron and proton, okay? And this is something that uh, has very important implication, especially at the large X, so there is a nice complementarity between the fixed target and collider DIS experiments. So this is a plot by Alberto, I think, or all. Uh, so when he basically shows that, uh, for example, in JLab, you can really have access to very large values of X for the D over U ratio. 
and it's accessible thanks to this low Q square fixed target experiment. So these are the kind of older experiments, LAC, BCDMS, NMC, Corus, Nutev, and then we have like newer data from JLab. And that's a nice testing ground for the nucleon models in the X to one limits. Okay, so it's very important to see where these PDF goes whenever X tends to one, because it really can validate or disprove some of the nuclear model that we have in the limit of X equal to one. Yes? Yeah, yeah. In a sense, you always relate uh, the um, PDF of the nuclear target that you have to the PDF of the proton by, via some nuclear models, okay? So for example, in the case of the deuteron, this is the kind of simplest assumption you can do. Of course, you can go beyond it by doing correction and using nuclear model on that. But the simplest assumption you say, okay, the, you take the F2 of the structure function of the proton, the structure function of the neutron, which are simply the one in which you swap the up and the down. And then uh, with that, you model the F2D. Of course, uh, especially when you go to the large X region and maybe Alberto here can say something, you have to go beyond this assumption and you have to do corrections to this simple assumption. But there are nuclear models that li really link the PDF that you see on the nuclear target to the PDF of the proton. So, and in the end, you can use the nuclear target to get information on the PDF of the proton. And then again, something that I just wanted to show you how um, beyond the obvious U bar, D bar, uh, whatever. So it's, for example, we have this data from Nutev and some from Corus that have neutrino, the AS of neutrino. So the neutrino scattering of nuclear target and then you always have a W exchange, right? Because you, you want to see a muon or an electron in the final stage. And the interesting thing here is that whenever you have this kind of interaction, you remember you have the CKM matrix elements, the one that mix the various flavors. And if you, again, this is just a parton model kinematics. So there is nothing more than that. It was the second exercise I gave you yesterday. So you can see that basically the, the coefficients here of the F2 neutrino, in particular, when you see a charm in the final state, you can tag a D meson and know that here in the final state, you have a charm quark, okay? So the, in these kind of experiments, they do um, a kind of, um, yeah, a charm tagged final state, okay? So what happens here is that clearly because of VCS, so the matrix element of the CKM matrix that couples the charm quirk with the strange is much larger than the other ones like CD or um, or C, CB or yes, so then VCD. You can see that this is the biggest contribution to the structure function. So due to the CKM enhancement, you can have a direct handle on the strange, which is much stronger than the handle you have on the down quirk because of the CKM matrix enhancement. So this data, are very important in order to constrain, constrain the strange distribution inside the proton, okay? And it's interesting because we have some mild tension between the strange distribution that you get from this kind of data and the one that we have from W plus charm, which has the same kind of CKM enhancement and I'll show you later, okay? So that's a very interesting, again, complementarity between the probes that you have from the DIS data and the probes that you have from the LHC data. Okay, let's go to the Drellian and uh, vector boson production data. So these are the ones that highlighted here. And here we have the fixed target Drellian that Alberto was mentioning. And here are the one that the Tevatron at the LHC. So this is the kinematics that I think Alberto was showing, was talking about earlier. So whenever you have a production of a lepton pair, lepton and lepton pair, at leading order, you always have these channels. You have Q, Q bar. So you always have U, U bar, D, D bar, and so on. And, um, and you have different coefficients in front of this luminosity, depending on the couplings you have here. No? So you have just the electric charge if you have a, a, a gamma, if you have a Z, you have uh, these other kind of couplings. So somehow playing with that, you can weight differently the various part of luminosities, okay? And instead, when you have the W, you mix U and D bar or U bar and D. And um, here, it's very interesting again to look at the fixed target Drellian 
because in this case, when you can have, for example, this is the E8 6 experiment, uh, and this is exactly what we were mentioning before. So here, um, and now we have the sequence that is much more precise. Okay, so you have proton on deuteron that goes into a muon uh, anti muon pair of proton protons. If you take the ratio of these two things, because of the parton kinematics that I've shown here, you really have u d bar plus d u bar divided by u u bar, which approximately, when you look, especially in the large X region, this is dominated by d bar over u bar. So this is something extremely important because these data constrain very well what is the ratio. That's why from the precise precision data like sequest, you can tell whether you have got more d bar or more u bar inside the proton, okay? Because Really, this all comes from the kinematics that you can see here and from what are the PDFs that are enhanced in a given large X region, okay? So, and here, in fact, okay, this was a, an old feat by an MPDF. You, you were showing that if you didn't have any um, Drellian data, any of these fixed target data, you basically you wouldn't constrain this ratio here. As soon as you add them, you have a nice uh, picked distributions, okay? Very good. Okay, uh, and then the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, other data that are super important because before when I was talking about the JLab data that constrained the U over D ratio, I was telling that this can be complemented by the W production at the Tevatron. Why so? Because when you have PP bar at the Tevatron into W plus, remember that you have U D bar, but D bar is like the D in the proton because of the charge conjugation. So this is like U D plus U bar D bar, right? And when you have PP bar onto W minus, you have D U plus D bar U bar. So when you do that, it's interesting because really this thing can constrain the U over D ratio at different values of X's because in this region of X, the quark are larger than the anti-quark. So you drop these terms and you just get the ratio of U over D and D over U at different values of X. So really looking at the simple, like leading order kinematics and at the simple formula for the, we learn a lot about what constrains what in a PDF fit, okay? And I will go faster because I want to conclude with the data. So here again, these are the Atlas and CMS measurements of the W and Z production that are extremely precise. And these are the kind of luminosity that they constrain. And uh, this is the, uh, in fact, I made a mistake, sorry. This is the formula that I've wrote before, but you have a M squared divided by S. It's, uh, I always get it wrong. Okay. And um, so again, you see the production of a boson. You put the value of the mass here, the center of mass energy of your collider and the rapidity range in which this has been measured and you, get what are the main values of axes that are constrained by those, okay? So playing with the high, low invariant mass, you can probe different regions and uh, playing uh, with rapidity, you have again different X region. For example, it's very important, very interesting that at the LHC, we have two kinds of experiment, Atlas and CMS, that probe the central rapidity region, okay? So they don't look into the forward production. So forward production is when the produced particle go toward the direction of the incoming beams, okay? Instead, central is when they go inside the detector that is all around the particles, okay? So, and in particular, we have a nice complementarity between Atlas and CMS that probe this region of rapidity. So here, I'm just plotting this formula over here. If you plot this formula over here, on the typical MX plot, you've got these two lines and everything in between, which is what is constrained by the central rapidity region. And LHCB instead constrains the forward rapidity region between two and 4.5. So this gives you a much larger value of X and much smaller values of X. Why? Because given the same M square over S, if you have larger values of the exponent, you get larger value over X and small. So you go to the extreme, no? So given the same ratio, if you have Y equal to zero, they constrain the same value of X. If you go to large value of Y, one constrains the very large X and one the very small X, okay? 
So extreme Y means extremely widely different X from the proton and the other proton that are constrained. Okay, let's I let's give you a break in five minutes. Let me just finish the, the thing about the data. So um, that's the thing I was mentioning, which is complementary to the fixed target experiment with neutrino or nuclear targets, which is the W plus charm data. Because again, if you tag a charm quark in the final state along with the W boson, you have a direct handle on both the strange and the down quark. But again, because of the CKM enhancement, you get a stronger handle on the, on the strange, okay? So that's it. And then let me just say that the gluon, so as I was mentioned, so the gluon at small x is partially determined by the scale dependence of the DIS structure function and also from the Drellian vector boson production, exactly because of the coupling between the quark and the gluon. So because F2 is proportional to the sum of all the quark plus anti-quark, and because this is coupled to the gluon, somehow the evolution of the structure function, how they change with the scale, depends on the gluon. But as you remember yesterday, the gluon grows faster as small x, okay? So that's why the change of the structure function with the scale give us a strong handle on the gluon, but only in the small x region, because the gluon grows faster there. Otherwise it's negligible when we go at larger x. So we need some other handles to really look at the gluon at large x. So the DIS is not enough. And um, there are lots of things uh, that we can look at. For example, um, if one looks at the production of heavy quarks, you really are looking at the gluon because, um, so that's another thing I wanted to, to mention really, really quickly. So why before when I said that uh, um, you, so let, let me just do that. So a, a quick intermission. So before I told you that you parameterize independently the up, anti-up, down, anti-down, strange, anti-strange. I never mentioned the charm, the bottom. Okay, the top quark is too heavy to be relevant uh, at the LHC. But what happens with the charm and the bottom? So the charm and the bottom, they are produced from the gluon. Okay, so the only way to produce, so we assume that because they're heavy quark, so the production mechanism is something like that. So you have a gluon that splits into a, a charm anti charm pair or a gluon that splits into a bottom anti bottom pair. Again, that's something that uh, you have two ways of dealing with this kind of splittings. You can say that they happen inside the proton. So at that point, inside the evolution of the parton, at some point, the gluon, you let it split also into charm, anti-charm, and bottom, anti-bottom. So if this splitting happens, if you want, inside the proton, okay, this is what you call a five flavor scheme. So inside the proton, you have five flavor that can be produced but the charm and the bottom are produced from the gluon. Okay, so they are produced only at a scale which is above their masses, okay? So it's, it's as if be below Q equal 1.4 GV, you don't have any charm. Above, the gluon can start producing them, okay? In this way. No, they're intrinsic. No, no, the, the bar you bar, they're intrinsic. Otherwise, you know, you wouldn't have uh, in nuclear physics you have up, up, down for the proton. So they're intrinsic inside the proton. It's just that inside the proton, lots of things happen, okay? So there is QCD. So you have the up, uh, up, down, but you also have other stuff because of the QCD interaction, okay? So you also have gluon, you have quark anti-quark that comes out of the gluon. You know, anything can happen inside because of the evolution, okay? But what I mean is that this part, so the charm, anti-charm, and bottom, anti-bottom, the difference is that they are produced after the threshold. So inside the proton, only if you look at it, when whatever happens inside has enough energy to create a pair of charm, anti-charm, or bottom, anti-bottom. So bottom, anti-bottom, this is 5 GV. So you need to have a gluon of at least 10 GV to produce it inside the proton. So they are produced at threshold, that's what we say. 
So they are not there at all scales in the proton, like the up, the down, and everything. They are there only at larger energy when the scale is above, let's say, twice the mass of the charm or twice the mass of the bottom, okay? Uh, it's because their threshold is too low. Yeah, they are always there, exactly. So they're intrinsic in the proton, okay? And instead, usually the charm, anti-charm, bottom, anti-bottom, they are not intrinsic. They are a product of the gluon. So they don't have a life of their own. They only depend on the gluon. So once you know the gluon, you know the charm and the bottom, okay? You don't have to fit them independently. Once you know what is the probability to have a gluon at the scale which is above their threshold, you know what are, what are the charm, anti-charm, and bottom, anti-bottom, okay? So that's why all these long speed, but I think it's important because you hear very often these terms. So if you, uh, maybe you never knew what they are, but you know, so this is why the measurement of charm, anti-charm and bottom, anti-bottom in the final state, they probe directly the gluon, okay? Because they come straight from that splitting over there. Um, and other handles on the gluon that constrain the gluon at, at large X are inclusive jets, because very often you have, leading order diagram that are gluon, anti-gluon that goes into quark and quark that then hadronize into jets. You also have top anti-top production or you have processes like Z plus jet production, which also give a direct handle on the gluon. So these are very different measurements that constrain the same large X region of the gluon. And sometimes they can give inconsistencies, okay? Um, so for the jets, uh, that's, again, you have a similar formula than for the Drellian, and um, depending on the PT of the jet that you're measuring and the rapidity of the jets, you have different initial states that are more important. For example, uh, let's, this is Tevatron disease, LHC. If you look at LHC, if you're looking at small PT of the jet, so the transverse momentum of the jet of hadron that comes out, you have 60% of the jets come from gluon, gluon into jets. 35% uh, per, come from gluon quark into jets and zero and 5% come from quark quark into jets. Okay, so depending on the PT that you are looking at, you have different initial parton that give you the final states you want. So playing with different rapidities, you can really look into large X quarks and gluon, okay? It's a bit like what we said before. Again, you play with the kinematics of the PT, of the jets you want to observe, and this gives you a very strong handle on both the quark and the gluon at large X. Does it make sense? Very good. And um, I will skip that. And the same for the transverse momentum distribution. Again, if you have questions, come in the break. I don't want to keep you here for too long. TT bar, again, it, it gives a very, very strong constraint on the large X gluon between 0 0.1 and 0 0.4. And, um, and these plus the jets give you even a stronger constraint. And then the other measurement that is very nice is uh, like uh, the direct photon production that again, constrain the gluon in the initial state. So as you can see here, the large jet gluon has a variety of many processes that give a direct handle. And that's it. So to summarize, we have all this kinematic here. So you have inclusive jets and digests for medium and large jets, isolated photon for medium large jets gluon, top pair production for the large jets gluon, high transverse momentum V plus jet for the medium X gluon and all these things for the quark. So as you can see, it's a really impressive. So I think my formula was right. So you have a very impressive range of things. And if you look forward, you know, so whenever you propose a new accelerator, for example, you can see the EIC, which is now running, gives a very important support to the fixed target that we had so far. So it gives a much larger region of X, which is constrained by the ESC. And again, here they have put some other FCC or LHEC, so experiments that maybe they will never happen, but you know, just to give, so whenever you, you, you propose an experiment, some plot that you always produce is what is the kinematical regions on the part and distribution function that you can cover with that particular experiment. So it's very important also to plan for future experiments to really see what are the additional constraints that you can have from this. And that's it. Um, 
that's it. I think I will just, let's have a break and then we talk about methodological aspects. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.